Hello, and welcome to this event, virtual panel on immigration. My name is Christopher Sands, and I'm director of the Canada Institute at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Immigration issues are playing a bigger role in Canada-US relations now. Not only are both countries jointly restricting the border to essential traffic only, but we've also seen changes on the US side on visa processing for business travelers who need a visa and students. We've also seen changes to, in Canada, focused on our asylum agreement, the Safe Third Country Agreement. To make sense of all of this, we have an expert panel. Richard Sanders is a global fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center's Canada Institute and a former member of the Senior US Foreign Service, having served in Ottawa as one of America's diplomat, diplomats. Teresa Brown also served in Ottawa for a while. She was the uh, first DHS liaison to Ottawa. She also was the founding uh, person to hold the job of DHS Canada Desk Director in Washington at DHS headquarters. She's now a, the Director for Immigration and Cross-Border Policy at the Bipartisan Policy Center here in Washington. And we have Mina Rafi. Mina Rafi is a managing attorney, attorney in the Erickson Immigration Group. She's Canadian but she works on U.S. and Canadian immigration laws, helping private clients to navigate their, uh, their documents and right to work. We're going to start with Richard. Um, Richard, how do you see immigration uh, unfolding now from your vantage point? Okay, well, first of all, uh, let me just say it's a real pleasure to participate in this panel. Thank, thank you very much, Chris, and, and also my fellow participants. Um, I'd like to just lead off with a quotation from a a great Canadian artist, uh, Joni Mitchell. Uh, in one of her songs, she said, don't it always seem to go, but you uh, don't know what you got till it's gone. And um, I think that kind of pretty much is where we are with the uh, US-Canada immigration situation. Um, I served in Canada 2013 to 2016. And uh, at that time, we had a very uh, kind of robust dialogue with Canada on immigration issues. Uh, we had worked with the Canadians on, uh, at the provincial level on getting recognition of uh, uh, kind of labor certifications. So a welder in Houston could move to Alberta and work, uh, uh, work up there and vice versa. Uh, we were uh, at least having discussions on the subject of the so-called TN visas, a NAFTA visa, which kind of allows for expedited movement of uh, uh, certain categories of a worker from one country to another. And of course, we were doing a great deal on uh, kind of the related border infrastructure, um, you know, uh, pre-clearance uh, operations at airports, and we were even talking about railroads. Um, so it seemed at a time that we were uh, kind of very much in sync on immigration issues. Um, obviously, a lot has changed since then. Uh, the COVID crisis has uh, done, you know, shut down most travel, and including immigrant travel to go with it. Um, but clearly over the previous three and a half years, um, changes in US policy with the new administration had, uh, had uh, taken effect on a range of areas. I don't think Canada was essentially targeted with regard to them, but in fact, many of them have had impacts uh, on the relationship. Um, I think we need to remember too, that there's always an ebb and flow uh, with regard to attitudes towards immigration in both countries. You know, the 19th century was the time when we let large numbers in from, from Europe. Um, after World War I, the valve got turned all, practically off. After World War II, then people, uh, particularly displaced persons from Europe, began to, to flow back in. And then later on, um, kind of a movement to accept immigration from Asia, Africa, the Middle East, Latin America uh, occurred in both countries. Um, so as I say, it's kind of, it, come, it comes and it goes. Um, uh, at the same time, we need to always remember that the U.S. and Canada have, uh, in spite of their similarities, different uh, immigration regimes and also uh, somewhat different circumstances regarding immigration. Um, let's remember, Canada actually takes more people as immigrants, as legal immigrants, per capita than the United States does. Uh, Canada has, I think, 11% of the population of the United States, but it lets in about 31% of the number of immigrants that we do. So per capita, uh, you would say it's, it is a country that is uh, even more so than the United States, uh, continuing to be a nation uh, of immigrants. 
Um, uh, our immigration systems are, are different and have different priorities. Uh, the two main flows from both of them are uh, immigration for e uh, economic reasons, but also for family reunification. Uh, in, uh, in the US, I would say the family reunification predominates and probably two thirds of the legal immigration to the US is on the basis of family reunification where relatives from someone who's already legally in the US are able to be brought in. In Canada, it's more like one third. And then in Canada, you have uh, a, uh, uh, on the economic side, uh, two thirds uh, are brought in that way. And uh, one third through, through a family reunification program that is actually um, probably more limited in uh, terms of the number and the kind of relatives that can be brought in. Um, also, uh, for economic uh, immigration, Canada uses a pretty sophisticated points system, uh, which uh, uh, based on your knowledge of French or English, the, the kind of skills you have, um, you're able to, uh, um, the, the availability of the, uh, the, uh, the job, um, you're able to kind of climb to the front of the queue. Uh, the U.S. system is rather different. It's uh, kind of based on uh, uh, sort of a need for a specific job and a labor certification from uh, from the Department of Labor that uh, that can't be filled by a, by an American, and uh, the Canadian system, as far as I can tell, is kind of more generous about letting you ultimately convert to permanent resident uh, status. Uh, the other big difference between the American and Canadian uh, immigration situation is the U.S. has um, uh, an enormous number of uh, illegal immigrants or undocumented, if you would prefer that term. Um, and the numbers, you know, you see the, the number that's usually kicked around is 10 or 11 million. Uh, Canada uh, does not have that. Uh, the reasons are obvious ge geography. We have a, a long border with Mexico and, and of course countries beyond that uh, long land border. Canada, uh, land borders with the United States, a, a country obviously of the same level of development. Uh, so whenever you think about immigration in the United States, the, il the uh, illegal or undocumented immigration uh, becomes a big part of the uh, uh, of the debate. Um, that said, um, I've looked at some polling on immigration, and uh, from what I've told, um, public attitudes do not seem to be that different. Um, there's a pretty recent uh, uh, poll that Gallup did in 2019 that basically has uh, about two thirds of Americans either support. Uh, current or increased immigration, and about a third would prefer less immigration. Um, an earlier Canadian poll, uh, with kind of rough, asking roughly the same thing, has roughly the same answers. Um, so, um, despite the noise of the immigration debate, uh, it's not necessarily the case that the American people are uh, strongly anti uh, anti immigration. Nonetheless, obviously things uh, things have developed in the last three and a half years. Uh, the U.S. has elected a president who made uh, restricting immigration a big part of his platform, although by no means the only part. Uh, and uh, uh, although much of it was with regard to illegal immigration and you know building the wall, etc., uh, we have seen over the last uh, uh, three and a half years a, uh, a progressive tightening, I would say, of uh, American immigration policy, uh, uh, and all done administratively by the executive branch. Not done, uh, uh, not done through the creation of a new immigration law, although there's the, the comprehensive immigration reform remains kind of a shibboleth that uh, we're a mirage perhaps that one day we will, uh, we will get there. Um, and obviously, you know, the, the developments with COVID have, you know, really thrown everything for a loop. And uh, I would say uh, both in direct response to COVID and as a continuation of its uh, Somewhat jaundiced view of immigration, uh, the uh, the Trump administration has has done some some important tightening, um, you know, formally shutting off visa processing for uh, H-1Bs, which are for for workers coming across, uh, J-1s for exchanges, uh, L visas, um, and uh, what's interesting is it's not just done on the basis that you know, administratively people can't get to work and can't process these visas, it's done with a uh, you know, the presidential statement explicitly says this is being done uh, for economic reasons that because of the uh, what's been done uh, to the economy by the uh, by the COVID crisis, uh, 
we need to reserve jobs uh, for Americans. And this seems to be different from where, what you see in Canada, where from what I can tell from looking at the media, um, the government is uh, kind of slowly uh, returning to visa processing uh, and hasn't made uh, any formal changes in, uh, in regard to, uh, to the, you know, the system or the, or the laws. Um, now, uh, in the U.S., we, we, you know, we, we've had some back and forth on student visas. Uh, the, the Trump administration uh, sought to prevent students from coming to, uh, who normally come to the U.S. to come if they were just going to go to university via video. And uh, because there's so much uncertainty on that, uh, there was a big pushback by the education community in the U.S. And uh, that, uh, that seems to be on hold for now. Um, another important area in which uh, the, uh, Trump has uh, 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 changed American immigration policy and that has had, I think, some impact on Canada is refugee policy. Um, uh, and of course, the U.S., like Canada, uh, belongs to you know, most all the various international uh, uh, agreements with regard to accepting refugees. Um, but uh, um, under the, the previous administration of President Obama, a ceiling on refugee admissions of 125,000 uh, was uh, uh, determined, although I believe the actual numbers that, uh, entered was considerably lower than that. Uh, the Trump administration has progressively lowered that, I think, to 60,000, then 30,000, then 18,000. And of course, it's not being processed at all for the, uh, for the time being. Um, uh, this has had uh, some effect, I think, on, on Canada. Um, because uh, under, Can under Canadian law, uh, if a, uh, uh, a, a would-be refugee enters Canada from the United States, uh, somehow, somehow has gotten into the U.S., uh, enters at a uh, port of entry, whether land or an airport, uh, and because the U.S. had been considered uh, a, a safe third country, they would be turned back and uh, basically be left to the U.S. to adjudicate their refugee claim. Um, however, uh, if you entered uh, as an irregular border crosser coming between the uh, um, ports of entry, uh, if, you, if you made it to Canada, you would, uh, you would be able to stay in Canada while your case is being adjudicated. Um, uh, as a result, especially when one, one of the Trump initiatives uh, was, to, was to dial back on so-called temporary protective status, which allowed a large number of immigrants from places like uh, Haiti and uh, Central American countries uh, to stay even without having been granted refugee status. Um, uh, as this uh, became in doubt, uh, we saw a number of, uh, an uptick in uh, uh, irregular border crossings. Uh, I think in New York and uh, Manitoba, I think were particularly af affected by this. Uh, the uh, uh, decision to uh, uh, to not to, to, to dial back on the temporary protected status, I believe, has gotten hung up in the courts, and so that flow has, I think, decreased. Uh, uh, but uh, Canada's own uh, uh, policy you know, of turning back people who apply at, uh, border, at uh, formal border crossings has now been called into doubt by Canada's court system, uh, which has uh, a, a, a justice has taken the view that. Uh, uh, the U.S., because of all the different policy changes, it no longer constitutes a safe third country where uh, uh, whose uh, kind of refugee adjudication system is to be considered the equivalent of Canada. And, uh, you know, what the impact of this will be is, remains to be seen because there's a six-month uh, grace period that the government of Canada has been given uh, to deal with this problem. Uh, 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 of course, at the same time, six months would take us into a new administration in the U.S., so... Uh, what that would mean for this, uh, this judicial decision uh, uh, is uh, unclear, I would say. Um, lastly, kind of the question arises, what happens next? Um, I would just say if, uh, if President Trump is re-elected, uh, re I think the odds are that we will have uh, you know, more, more of the same, uh, continued uh, intensification of efforts at control uh, and indeed limitation of immigration. Uh, what some of the things provisionally uh, enacted uh, uh, as a result of um, uh, the COVID situation uh, will, will doubtless be continued. Uh, if uh, Vice President Biden is elected, uh, 
he hasn't spoken a great deal on, on immigration, although I believe there is an immigration pla uh, element to his, to his platform and he said some things. I think you're likely to see essentially a rollback of a lot of the tightening that the Trump administration has done to kind of the status quo ante, uh, certainly with regard to refugee admissions, which I think would probably be returned to historic levels. But uh, all that perhaps is for a discussion on uh, January 21st. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Richard. Now to Teresa Brown. Teresa? Uh, thank you, Chris. Thank you for inviting me and thank you to all of you uh, to join you on the panel today. Um, just following on what Richard has said, I, I, I do think that there's a, a little bit of a sense that everything old is new again. Uh, my tenure in Canada and working in US-Canada issues at DHS was uh, from about 2005 to 2011. So uh, covering the latter years of the Bush administration, the early years of the Obama administration. And, you know, we were still dealing a lot with the fallout after 9-11. And at that time, if you recall, the United States and Canada were also not exactly on the same page when it came to how to jointly manage the border, how to look at immigration issues. Um, and I think we're in another period like that right now. Um, but as Richard noted, in between, uh, we did a lot of work to solidify the relationship. And one of the things I worked very hard on when I was at DHS and when I was in Canada was trying to institutionalize uh, the relationships between the agencies that manage the border and manage immigration to enable the kind of conversations that Richard was talking about, about immigration. And even in the midst of all of what has been happening of late, um, it's, it's very telling to me that in the announcement of the COVID border closures, uh, the United States unilaterally essentially announced closures with Mexico. Uh, it was Canada that announced the closures with the United States and said it had been a joint decision. And to me, that is sim symbolic a little bit of the extent to which our countries really do try to work together on these issues as much as possible, even when the governments in charge may not see eye to eye on a lot of things. Uh, I think over the last decade and a half, what we have seen is an institutionalization of that relationship far below the political levels, where bureaucrats in both countries try to maintain conversation, uh, communication with each other, and where they can work together uh, on a lot of issues. And I think you see that in how various policies have played out, even under the Trump administration. Um, so for example, uh, when the president instituted the immigrant visa uh, suspensions or the non-immigrant visa suspensions of the work visas, as Richard said, the H's, L's, J's, uh, pretty quickly, within 24 hours, it was made clear that this wouldn't apply to most Canadians. Why not? Well, generally, Canadians don't require visas, and the suspension was a visa issuance. So most Canadians don't require visas to enter the United States in most categories. They can simply come to the border if they've had approval of their petition ahead of time or in certain cases just apply at the border. And that meant that for essential travel, which was including work-related tra travel, Canadians could still cross the border. Um, the fact that that announcement came out fairly quickly there after the uh, executive order was issued tells me that there's still a lot of communication happening between the governments of Canada and the United States, even when the policy directions are somewhat different. Um, and I think that that is emblematic of um, the relationship the countries have had over time. You know, we've had divergences of policy before. We will surely have them again, uh, depending on the governments in power in either Canada or the United States. And yet there is this, I think, tendency toward uh, trying to work together as much as possible, no matter what is going on. Um, so I think that where Richard is absolutely right, this administration in the United States has frankly taken more actions on immigration than at any time I have seen since immediately after 9-11. Um, and almost all of them have been uh, restrictionist in nature, as in cutting back on legal immigration, cracking down on undocumented migration, restricting asylum and refugee, and not all of them have come with executive orders. A lot of them are policy changes made by the bureaucracies and governments. Uh, the Migration Policy Institute did, recently did a tally of over 400 different immigration related policy changes, regulatory proposals, and just simply changes of process uh, that the administration has implemented uh, since Trump has come into office. And again, not all of them have been related to COVID. A lot of them took place before we knew about COVID. But I think COVID-19 has given the administration another 
rationale, if you will, to do some of the things that it has already decided to do. So for example, the immigrant visa uh, suspension came after, as, as Richard mentioned, most US consular processing around the world had already been suspended for the protection of consular officers around the world and prevention of COVID. Um, so it didn't have a lot of immediate impact, but the rationale given wasn't to protect the United States from COVID, it was to protect United States workers from competition from immigrants who were on the verge of being approved to come to the United States. They'd already had petitions approved. They'd already gone through the labor certification process. This is the final stage of getting the visa and clearance to come to the United States, and suddenly they're all put on hold. This was the administration saying, we know that our immigration laws have built-in protections for American workers. We don't think it's good enough now, so we're going to just suspend everything. Uh, that is unique. No other country in the world that I am aware of has imposed such restrictions, not on the basis of spreading the disease, but on the basis of protecting its economy. And so that gives you an idea of where the administration is thinking about these things. Um, I think also, um, you know, the, 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 the differences in how we are dealing with our own visa systems. Um, you know, the United States did, uh, a couple of weeks ago, or ICE, the agency that runs the Student and Exchange Visitor Program, announced that uh, students who were returning to the United States or already in the United States, but were pursuing a fully um, online course of study in the fall, would not be eligible to retain their visa. Uh, they backtrack that within about four days, in part because of a very large pushback uh, from the university and higher education system and businesses and a whole bunch of other people. But it's important to note that it's still, the ban is still in place for foreign students coming from outside the United States who haven't been here before. So incoming freshmen cannot pursue an online only course of study. Now, that may sound harsh. In fact, that is the default. Before there was a COVID, our visa system did not allow foreign students to come to pursue solely online courses. So the administration is, is basically continuing that default for new students, but allowing existing students to pursue an online course. If you look at the Canadian policy on students, though, uh, they recently announced that online courses would be okay. The main uh, hurdle for foreign students coming to Canada right now is whether or not their travel is considered essential. And that's based on how Canada is defining its border restrictions from places around the rest of the world. But they have not categorically said that an online course of study would be debarring. Um, and there are students in the United States that are looking at alternatives to, go in, you know, to come to the United States, as are foreigners who would have been coming on H-1B visas and L visas. Uh, the Canadian companies have been actively recruiting uh, with that line saying, can't get a visa to come to the United States? Think about Canada. Uh, literally in the advertisements. So one of the long-term issues that I see from the way the United States is dealing with this right now is that we are ceding, if you want to be a little nationalistic, can U.S. advantage to Canada on immigration. Um, and while we love it when all of North America see, see, succeeds together, uh, this isn't exactly the way it should be done. <laughs> uh, this kind of competition and, and the fact that we're shooting ourselves in the foot in many ways by deterring foreign, foreign companies from investing in the United States because they won't be able to bring their executives in to run their country, companies. Or uh, foreign students who can't come to the United States who are looking for English language study or even French language study in Quebec. Um, you know, come, people who have uh, advanced degrees in technical fields, companies are building R&D facilities across the border in Canada uh, because they can get visas more easily for them there than in the United States. I mean, this isn't just since the Trump administration, it's a function of our very outdated and broken immigration laws, but it's been exacerbated by the policies of this administration. And so I think that where we had pretty robust cross-border mobility between the United States and Canada, given our different immigration systems. Uh, it's definitely been curtailed, and now we're in an era, I think, of more competition. Um, and again, I think, as Richard said, depending on how the um, election comes out, we'll either see more of the same or a reversal of some of these policies. But I would caution that, um, you know, the Democrats traditionally have been more aligned with the Labor Party's 
in the United States and the labor in the United States. And they also have some skepticism about immigration and who can come in. They like immigrants, uh, but immigration is something that they have skepticism about. So it's unclear what his legal immigration platform might be. Um, and so I think there's a little to be determined there. Um, I'll leave the rest of the time so we can let Mina speak and have questions, but I look forward to having more conversation on this. Thank you very much, Teresa. And let me just put in a plug. Those of you who are watching online, you can send in a question either by email to Canada Institute at wilsoncenter.org or uh, as a tweet uh, to our Twitter handle, which is at Canada Institute. Um, those questions we will uh, get to as soon as we've heard from our third speaker, Mina Rafi. Mina? Um, thank you so much, Chris. Um, and thank you to my co-panelists. I mean, it looks like both Teresa and Richard pretty much summarized uh, what I was going to say in terms of what's coming from the business perspective or the legal practice of U.S. business immigration. Um, you know, as Teresa mentioned, um, over the past four years, the Trump administration has dramatically transformed the U.S. Um, immigration landscape, and not just sort of in bold brush sweeping ways, but also in some really small technical details across the immigration spectrum. And I think what this will essentially mean is that even if we have a different administration come into power um, in January, some of these changes are going to be very difficult to sort of implement and sort of the timeline that it's going to take for all of these decisions to be reversed. Um, in terms of the administration themselves, I mean, it's not a surprise given that during the 2016 campaign, uh, President Trump pledged to take one of the most activist agendas on immigration in modern times. And frankly, um, they have delivered on nearly everything they promised on the campaign trail. Um, and as I, Richard had mentioned, it's been mostly through sort of executive orders and small internal policies um, that they've pushed on the Department of Homeland Security or USCIS. Um, and what this has meant for um, sort of businesses is that this administration has essentially tightened an already difficult bureaucratic maze for not only individuals that are wishing to enter the United States, uh, but also for companies who would like to bring in foreign talent uh, to meet some of their business needs because the talent is just not available in the US. Um, specifically uh, in my practice, I work with not only startup companies, but Fortune 500s focused primarily in Silicon Valley. And so demand for the type of you know, software engineers and the data analysts um, and data scientists that we see they are having very difficult time filling some of these roles, which is why these companies spend literally thousands of dollars um, to get these com uh, to get this talent into the United States. And as I mentioned, um, regardless of whether the pendulum will swing after the election in the fall, um, this presidency has definitely um, have a lasting effect on U.S. immigration system, uh, which will inevitably sort of impact on how you know potential students and even potential talent uh, will think about moving to the U.S. if an offer is made for them, um, and how the businesses themselves have sort of evolved and changed their immigration programs over the course of the past four years. Um, so the environment that I've been working in in the past three and a half years, and naturally the businesses have spent a lot of time essentially preparing and scaling their immigration programs to provide opportunities for some of the most talented candidates that they have outside of the U.S. And they have focused primarily in Canada because of some of the obvious advantages, both in terms of time zone and proximity. So they can have, you know, offices in Seattle or in San Francisco, but also have an office in Vancouver. Um, and we have seen sort of two um, um, trends in terms of what the businesses have done. One group has focused primarily in terms of using Canada as a place to sort of park some of their employees that have been impacted by the Trump administration's uh, policies. And other ones have gone ahead and actually expanded their Canadian offices because they're looking at this as the long-term investment uh, of not only just sort of moving some of their employees that are impacted, but also seeing that a lot of people are not interested in returning back to the U.S. Um, given some of the insecurities that are typically involved. Um, you know, these are people that are um, transferring with their families, with their spouses, with their children. And if there's this much insecurity 
uh, involved, these people are not going to want to uh, live in the United States. And so they're looking at long-term impacts. In addition to that, what we've also seen is a lot of these companies have also started recruiting um, in Canadian universities when they didn't before. So they're also looking at the talent pool of F1 sort of students that are coming in um, for national students studying at Canadian universities because maybe their the flow has sort of stopped or at least slowed down on the US side. So there's another sort of venue for them to attract talent. And by providing um, more larger offices and sort of investment in Canada, it has only opened more doors for them. And so that's what we've been seeing on the client side over the course of the past um, three and a half years. Now, in terms of the major trends, I mean, there are two big things that we have seen. One, as I mentioned earlier, companies moving jobs outside of the United States, focusing primarily in Canada in terms of our clients. Um, <clears throat> and there was actually a fantastic article by Bretta Glennon from the Wharton School of Business um, who essentially showed the U.S. multinational companies had already offshore tens of thousands of jobs and opened new foreign entities, uh, whether it be affiliates or subsidiaries, um, in response to the H-1B visa restrictions that were even less severe than those that are being implemented now. So you can imagine that some of these businesses are already thinking ahead and finding even greater opportunities. Um, and the countries obviously that benefited the most um, at the time um, and who are going to benefit once again, given the current sort of environment, was of course Canada, followed by China and India. In fact, we have some clients, as I mentioned, that are doing recruitment in Canada and have also started doing recruitment even in India universities, uh, which is sort of something new for us to think about, just to give you an idea of how far they're willing to go to find the right talent uh, for their businesses. And if it means that they have to expand offices in their local countries or even move them to Canada, um, they're going to do that because this is really sort of a supply and demand driven uh, process for them in terms of their immigration programs. So that's sort of um, item one. And item two, like the multinational companies, investors will also seek investment opportunities outside of the U.S. Um, you know, history has shown us that foreign investment and innovation is tightly linked to immigration. And I think Richard touched on this um, when he was sort of giving us a history, um, and rightfully so. And companies will go where the talent is uh, or where the talent wants to stay. So if you have a, you know, very sophisticated software engineer or a data scientist and they don't feel secure about their prospects in the U.S. Um, and want to sort of establish roots somewhere else, um, they will naturally go to another country and the business will follow them and will do what they need to do in order to retain that talent. Um, you know, nearly half of all Fortune 500 companies were founded by either immigrants or their children. Um, so some of the talented immigrants originally destined for the U.S. instead choose to Canada. That will mean that what we'll see is an increase in innovation coming out of Canada within the 5, 10, 15 years from now where this talent pool is and in inevitably these investors are going to follow that. Um, <clears throat> now a perfect illustration and I think Teresa touched on this as well uh, in terms of the impact of some of these restriction policies are having and how companies in Canada are really taking advantage of attracting the talent is, you know, immediately after, I think it was one or two days after the most recent executive order sort of banning the non-immigrant visas came out, um, Shopify's um, CEO sent out a tweet essentially inviting impacted individuals um, to give Canada a try. And they included a link to their recruitment page for them to potentially transfer. Um, and for those you know, that might not be familiar with Shopify, it's one of the largest and growing e-commerce platforms based in Ottawa, and they are just poaching wherever they can. And the current administration has made it very easy for them to do so because um, Canada's sort of <clears throat> immigration process has made it much simpler and faster compared to what they would typically have to go through um, if they remained in the U.S. So unfortunately, rather than sort of focusing on the dire public health and economic crisis um, affecting communities across the U.S., this pandemic has essentially supercharged this current administration's immigration agenda that they've had from the beginning. Uh, but this has also presented opportunities 
uh, for businesses um, you know, globally to look at other countries that are going to be more friendly in terms of the workflow. And I think this becomes um, even more uh, of an option as we're finding out during this pandemic that remote work uh, is possible. So maybe the team doesn't necessarily need to be based in San Francisco. You can have people that are based in Vancouver, in Ottawa, in Toronto, um, and still run um, a very sort of tight team. Thank you very much, Mina. And we already have a question from the audience. Before I get to that question, I must correct myself. If you want to send in a question by email, it's not Canada Institute at wilsoncenter.org. It's just Canada at wilsoncenter.org. So sorry for that uh, muff on my part. Mina, we have a question from an individual, American, who says, how soon can I come to my home in Nova Scotia, which I've had for 30 years? Uh, this is that obviously someone who wants to do a bit of recreational traveling. Do you have any sense um, and are, do you have any advice for someone who's trying to cross the border for a purely personal reason such as that? I, I want to hear this too because this is the week that I'm supposed to be in my Canada home in Quebec and I'm in the U.S. instead. Please Mina, tell me. Um, absolutely uh, and you know it's something that my own mother asks me on a weekly basis because I also have family in Toronto, it's my home city and so I'm dying to go back just as much as everybody else's. Unfortunately from what we've been seeing um, and hearing in terms of the Canadian government it doesn't look like there is much movement or interest in trying to open the borders anytime soon, especially as we're seeing increased numbers of uh, COVID-19 infections on the US side. Um, you know, this could go as far as 2021 actually. So I apologize. <laughs> There are options available uh, for people to go. I mean, it, you know, you have to sort of see if you fit into any of the exceptions. If you, for example, are married to a spouse of a Canadian, um, there are obvious rules in terms of quarantine and having sort of a plan. Um, but you might be surprised what options might be available that you can fall into one of the exceptions. And we can also probably see the current administration expanding some of these exceptions. Um, as the demand grows, but for the time being, I don't think these are going to change anytime soon. Well, it wasn't what we wanted to hear, but it was uh, still an honest answer. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I have another question really following up on, on this. There, there was a discussion in all of your presentations about the pandemic as a driver for some of these, but not all of these changes. In a happier scenario, imagine that we have a vaccine to address uh, COVID-19 by the end of the calendar year. How long would it take to get back to a normal, quote unquote, or a, a normal before the pandemic status uh, for managing people's flow across the border, either joint border restrictions or, or visa categories, or is this going to be with us regardless? Um, Teresa, what do you think? Um, you know, I think uh, there's a couple things. First of all, so much depends on the election here in November. And that is because, as I think everybody has said, the um, incredible number of changes have all been made by this administration and not by Congress. If Congress had made these changes, they would be in statute, they would continue to the next administration. But these are all executive changes. And just like President Trump overturned some of the executive actions that President Obama took, uh, if Joe Biden is elected in the United States, he could overturn some of the executive actions that President Trump has taken. Now, some can be overturned more quickly. Any executive order can be abolished by a stroke of a pen of a new president. Um, others can take longer, particularly if we have regulations. Uh, the Administrative Procedure Act in the United States governs how regulations are written and implemented. And once a regulation, regulation is finalized, it can't be immediately revoked. It, there has to be a notice and comment about revoking that regulation and or rewriting that. That process can take many, many months. So some things can stick longer, even if it's an executive action, than others. And I think we have to see how many of these changes would be immediately overtaken, how many would take longer to undo. And to be honest, as we're still stuck with the immigration law that was written uh, in the 1965 or last updated in 1990, decades old immigration law, which 
frankly, is very out of sync with what most Americans would like to see, a much more transparent, straightforward immigration system. That is also something President Trump has talked about. He's talked about a merit-based system. He looks favorably on the Canadian points-based system, but that would require Congress to do something, and Congress has not. Now, he made some noise a week or so ago about trying to do this by executive order, left a lot of people scratching their heads. We're still scratching our heads. We haven't seen anything yet. Um, to, to see what he's trying to do. But I, I think that, like I said, some things could be rolled back quickly. Some might take a little longer and some may stay in place. And like I said, our statutory process, how you get an H-1B, how you get an L-1 uh, is, is still very challenging, uh, even under the best of circumstances. Um, thank you for that. R Richard, we, we don't have at the moment, the United States does not have an ambassador in Ottawa. How, how does the embassy cope with questions like this? And do you think not having an ambassador in place, although we have a nominee, hasn't been confirmed, how do you think that affects the ability of our diplomats to address concerns surrounding immigration and, and other things? Well, the main advantage of having an ambassador uh, in country is the high level access he will have both in Canada and perhaps even more importantly, back in the United States. You know. Uh, when I worked with Ambassador Heyman, he was able to get on the phone and, uh, you know, deal with uh, you know, problems as, as they arose. And uh, it's always a struggle uh, with the U.S. government, which is so large uh, and with so many concerns at the most senior levels to get them to say, hey, there's a Canada angle. And don't forget, Canada is our largest trading partner. If you include goods and services, millions of people want to cross the border, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, I think uh, if you look at uh, uh, what, what President Trump has done, uh, I don't think it's necessarily aimed at Canada. His rhetoric is almost always about Mexico, if it's about anything. Uh, but uh, no, when, you're, when your embassies are not staffed and staffed well, um, you know, you, uh, you pay a price. And uh, uh, it's uh, just in terms of the, the fluidity that is necessary to make, uh, you know, uh, to make the relationship work. Thank you for that. We have another question from our viewers. Uh, the question is, what about the TN visa? This was what the US calls the NAF, or calls a NAFTA visa, Canada would call it a NAFTA visa. We just have a new trade agreement, the USMCA. What's changed and are TN visas in this current uh, situation also suspended? Um, who would like to take that one on first? Okay, I'll pick one of you. <laughs> <laughs> Teresa, Mina, wanted you well, start and then Mina second talking about how businesses cope in that environment. Sure, I'll just start by saying that nothing changed with the TN visas. Uh, they were not touched via USMCA. So even though NAFTA is no more, the visa classifications that were created under NAFTA still exist, in part because in the United States, at least, they were statutorily enacted and that statute has not been repealed. And they are also in our regulation. Uh, so the TN visa continues to apply as it did before USMCA. Um, and it, the TN was not affected by the, the non-immigrant visa category ban. So TN visas are still allowed to enter the United States subject to the border restrictions of essentialness um, and that are going both ways. So uh, again, and a TN doesn't require a visa of Canadians, so they can apply directly at the border or they can apply by petition ahead of time and show up at the border to be admitted. Um, you know, how many are crossing right now, again, due to the border restrictions, I can't say. Mina may have some more details on that. Mina? So in terms of the TN adjudication, uh, Teresa's right, we haven't seen any major changes. Uh, majority of the restrictions really come from the businesses themselves that have put some sort of internal travel restrictions for their own employees. So a lot of people that were planning on transferring to the United States, either because of the business or the employee not feeling comfortable moving to the U.S. at the moment, uh, what they've done is essentially kept them on U.S. Uh, payroll or move into Canadian payroll until they're ready and comfortable to transfer. That being said, even though, you know, the current executive order hasn't impacted TN, there have been no changes with this new updated agreement. 
over the course of three and a half years, we have seen additional scrutiny on TN adjudications across the board, uh, especially for individuals that typically apply at the port of entry to the point where we actually had to sort of re-strategize um, and do all the pre-filings through USCIS and then send the approval notice for the Canadian nationals for them to apply because what we were seeing was a lot of pushback uh, from CBP officers on the TN category, specifically under um, whether it came under engineers or economists. And these have been individuals that were able to sort of transfer without any issues, can just go apply, present their documents at the border, let the officer know exactly what type of position they're applying for, give their job duties and get the approval. Um, under the current administration, we saw major pushback to the point where we had to make sure the employees had the approval notice before they go, uh, because it was very difficult to get some of the approvals. Um, I, I would just add, add something. The uh, Richard, you've gone on mute, I'm afraid. Yeah, I, hang on a sec. We can hear you now. Sorry, I think we could hear you and I messed it up. I'm just gonna go away and let you fix it. Okay, how are we doing? Are we, are we good? Okay. Um, you know, uh, when I was serving in Canada as DCM, uh, there was interest on the Canadian side to update the list of professions uh, that was covered under the TN uh, visa. And actually, uh, just uh, earlier this morning, I, um, I took a look at that source of all wisdom, Wikipedia, which had a list of all the professions. And it really is uh, not, not that up to date. Um, if you look at the IT side, there's one category, I think computer systems analyst. And, uh, you know, of course, like NAFTA was 1994 that it came into effect. And imagine how that whole sector has changed. Uh, and um, from what I understand, when the time came to negotiate the uh, US-Canada-Mexico uh, uh, agreement, the successor to NAFTA, uh, uh, the initial position of the Trump administration was to abolish the TN visa. And it took a lot of persuasion to get them to keep it in uh, as is. Uh, but if your goal, which obviously is not the goal of this administration, is actually greater integration between, uh, you know, within North America, uh, uh, modernizing the, the TN list would have been um, a very useful tool to help you get that way, uh, get where you need to be. Uh, and, uh, you know, perhaps uh, that will be something they look at again. Although even, even then, there was always a sense from USTR that uh, be careful, Congress is not excited about that kind of thing. Uh, but it's, uh, it's out there on the to-do list one way or another. Yeah, I just would add to that that all my entire tenure at DHS from 2005 to 2011, there was conversations around whether or not to update the TN list. And I would just remind that it's trilateral. Um, mm -hmm. And so we actually got to the point at one point of having a list from Canada and a list from Mexico and a list from the United States. And I think there were two occupations that Canada and US agreed on and none that Canada, US and Mexico agreed on and it never moved further than that. So that just tells you a little bit about the difference uh, in how the countries are looking at the priorities of border crossing. Uh, it's not without its challenges and that's probably one of the reasons why it has stayed as it is since the mid 1990s. We have another question from one of our viewers and Mina, I'm gonna send it over to you. One of the viewers reacted a little bit to the thought of parking employees in Canada. And there's been a debate in Canada as to whether people were going to be parking in Canada and then not putting down roots and that someday if the US ever opened up, they'd be the first to leave. What's happening in the corporate sector with regard to people? You mentioned a little bit that some firms have a much more uh, permanent strategy to build up what they're, they're doing in, in Canada. But is there still that sort of feeling that temporary parkers are uh, really not that committed to the Canadian economy? What can Canada do to keep them around, even if they have been just parked north of the border? So I think um, under the current administration, what we've been seeing is that a lot of people that do have the opportunities to come back are not. Um, you know, I was recently working on an application where we had done um, an L1 a a petition for um, a very high level executive um, and they just wanted to use the L1 as an intermittent visa where they're sort of 
traveling back and forth, but they're primarily based out of Canada. And I, when I reached out to him, because when we initiated the process, I knew that the long-term goal was for them to come to the U.S. Um, he said, no, I'm quite happy where I am in Canada and I have no interest given you know, the current environment. I don't want to uproot my family um, and leave uh, Canada and move to the U.S. So that, I mean, so I guess I should, the term parking is um, not necessarily just short term. It's just making sure that the talent is remaining as close to HQ as possible. Um, and it's really going to come down to the individuals, how they feel with where they are living, uh, the type of office that they're working in, how their family has established some of the roots that they've already planted in Canada. Um, and as a Canadian, I have to tell you, it's very difficult to leave Canada. <laughs> so I'm sure it's just as difficult for these people as well. Fair enough. Um, uh, good, good point all the way around. Um, do uh, Teresa, do you have any sense of uh, whether U.S. policy has been at all focused on those temporary parkers? And uh, you think about places like Waterloo, Ontario, and Vancouver, that particularly in the tech sector where the jobs are high paying and so on, has there been a, a feeling in the U.S., but particularly in Congress, that this is an end run around the H-1B and that we must come to terms with the Canadians on this? Or is it really still a safe thing for, uh, for tech workers and others to do? So I would say in general, the debates around the H-1B and L-1 visas don't focus on Canada very much. Um, it, it's, it's a worldwide phenomenon. Uh, it is true that the majority of H-1B and L-1 workers come from China and India. Um, so they're not native Canadians. Um, and so a lot of it is where the company chooses to assign them. Um, one thing I will know is that, you know, in the mid 1990s, when I started working on these issues, the H-1B visa has always had some controversy, um, primarily because of many of the companies that use that visa are IT service companies, uh, what we call outsourcers. And they were bringing in people to the United States on these temporary visas that were taking over functions from U.S. companies that had their own employees. And so this was very controversial. And so the H-1B category has been controversial for a while. I think one of the things that has evolved since then is that as companies have adopted different strategies, such as creating U.S. or foreign affiliate companies that they can use the L visa, which is an intra-company transferee visa, the L visa has started to become more controversial. And so you saw the culmination of that, if you will, in the executive order uh, suspending temporary work visas because it included L1 visas. Now, L1 visas are of two major types. They're managers and executives. So your COO, your CEO, your C, you know, the CTO, like the, the C-suite executives come in, uh, major managers of divisions of the company can come in. And then there's also a provision for what are called specialized workers. And these are people who supposedly according to the law, have specialized knowledge of the product or service that is necessary to continue providing that product or service at the U.S. affiliate. Um, it's this latter com category that has been the focus of a lot of attention in Congress as being a substitute, if you will, for H-1B, which is cap limited, because these categories are not cap limited. And the fact that companies may have been creating subsidiaries overseas to then bring people back on an L instead of just filing for an H is seen as a workaround. So I think as Congress has looked at these categories of the last couple of decades, increasing focus has been played, paced, excuse me, placed on this practice as a way of avoiding the labor certification protections, if you will, that exist in the H-1B category. Um, Every year there are bills introduced that would reform the H-1B category and the L-1B category to limit this, this use of the category. They have not passed so far. Uh, just this week, uh, we've heard that a bill in Congress being negotiated between Senators Durbin and Senator Lee about per country caps may also affect the H and L categories. Um, so I, I would say that for the US government, the focus isn't really on Canada, it's just on how these visas are being used. The, unfortunately, I think the, the answer is restricting their use to make it harder to get these visas. And the business community in the United States argues every time that if you, the harder you make it to get these visas, the more companies will just go elsewhere and not come here at all. So not only will you use the foreign workers in the United States, you'll lose the U.S. workers who would work with those foreign workers in the United States because whole divisions will be going elsewhere. 
And we have seen some of that. Um, but I think that is the conversation that's happening. And I think it's, a, it's not a correct one. I think we do need to think more seriously about uh, how we are, if you will, losing ground to other places in the world and what that may mean for our economy in the long run, as Mina said. Um, but our system isn't designed that way and, and we're not thinking that way very well. Thank you very much for that. Um, Richard, can I follow up with, with you on, on the question of, of refugees and asylum uh, seekers? This is always a, a heart-rending category because often people are leaving fairly dire situations. Do you think if we're unable to resolve the issue of the safe third country agreement between Canada and the United States, as the pandemic continues, will we see pandemic refugees or people fleeing poor health care in their home country trying to find Canada or the U.S.? in order to uh, be more health secure. Um, wh what's your view on that? It's certainly a possibility. Um, of course, with the, uh, it, to the extent that COVID continues, the borders will continue to be, you know, quite, uh, 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 quite closed, which will, which will you, 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 you may see large numbers of, uh, you know, would-be refugees sitting on the Mexican border uh, waiting for a way to get in the U.S. Uh, you may, see, you know, and and uh, you know, Canada has in the past seen episodes of uh, uh, kind of boat people, um, uh, in which people left, uh, you know, illegal immigration from China that washed up on British Columbia some years ago. Um, and all these are out there. Uh, you know, obviously, the best outcome for everybody is uh, is a vaccine, uh, but. Uh, no one can predict when that will, uh, will, will resolve the problems. And, uh, you know, refugee flows uh, are, um, you know, there's, there's large, you know, even, even with or without COVID, there's large areas uh, that are, um, you know, uh, where the quality of life and, and, and of governance is uh, conducive to refugees. Uh, one issue that I think Canada may be facing in the not that distant future is Hong Kong. Um, Britain has already spoken about uh, accepting a certain, you know, because of their, their historic uh, you know, relationship and, and people holding uh, you know, British passports, large numbers of uh, Hong Kongers may want to come to Canada, Canada has, or to Britain, and they may want to come to Canada too. And I believe the Canadian government has at least made some preliminary noises about having to address this issue. So, you know, watch this space. Absolutely. Thank you very much for that, Richard. Uh, a final question from our viewers. This is a very specific question. Uh, I think maybe, Mina, you're the first person to answer it, but we'll invite you all to, to jump in on it. The, the viewer asks, as a Canadian citizen, no, a dual U.S. Canadian citizen who is U.S. resident, so they're living in the U.S., but they're dual citizens, can they cross the border with a Canadian passport from the U.S. into Canada um, if they're able to prove that they have a place to quarantine? Um, so yes. you hadn't been able to get a straight answer on that. Yes. Yeah. The, I don't foresee them any, uh, having any sorts of issue provided that they have a valid passport um, or even, for example, like a birth certificate showing that they are Canadian citizen. Um, there shouldn't be any issues provided that they meet all the sort of quarantine restrictions. Excellent. Thank you very much. That's, that's one problem solved by this panel <laughs> already, which is wonderful. Uh, excellent. Let me invite each of you just to uh, give us a, a closing thought about what happens next. Um, does the, do these issues become more intense prior to the election uh, in the United States? Are they likely to be with us uh, after that? And, and what can people who want to improve this situation maybe do for themselves uh, or, or perhaps to advocate for different policy outcomes? Um, we'll go in the order that we spoke. So I'll ask you, Richard, to start. Um. I guess what I see on the horizon, perhaps the midterm horizon, is whether the issue of comprehensive immigration reform uh, gets uh, any traction within the U.S. government. Uh, I mean, the fact is our current immigration system, which is actually the result of a series of reforms to reforms to reforms, and is kind of a Rube Goldberg uh, uh, kind of contraption, uh, whether it makes sense. Um, you know, uh, whether or not you, you know, agree with a lot of what President Trump says, uh, the question of a point system is, is a valid one. Uh, and uh, uh, although 
family reunification has a big lobby in the US, mainly the families that are already here. Um, but, uh, you know, I think uh, as has happened in the past, sooner or later, a fresh look at our whole immigration regime may uh, be in order. Thank you for that. Teresa? Um, I Unfortunately, I do think at least in terms of our U.S. electoral process, immigration will continue to be for this administration a very big issue. Um, President Trump has shown that every time uh, he's down in the polls or something else is going on that is uh, making his administration look not great, he leans in heavily on immigration. And um, I think we'll continue to see that uh, leading up to the election. Uh, you know, what happens thereafter, obviously, I think, we was, as we said, if he, get, if he gets reelected, I think we'll continue to see executive action. I think we'll see the temporary measures become permanent. We have seen a lot of uh, proposed regulations put in place that will become final. We've also seen with this administration a record number of federal uh, litigation cases against the executive actions of this president. I would expect that to continue. Um, a lot will depend on the makeup of Congress after this election. If uh, the Democrats are able to take a majority in the House and the Senate, uh, they may be able to act as a check on some of what the president has done. The Republican majority in the Senate has not allowed Congress to function uh, very much as a check uh, on the executive so far when it comes to immigration. Um, so that may change the dynamic somewhat. If President Biden is elected, uh, he has promised to undo some of the executive actions that President Trump has done, most, mostly relating to the border, uh, mostly relating to things like the travel ban, which was early from uh, President Trump's presidency, uh, repeal the public charge rule, um, and some of those things. He hasn't spoken much about legal immigration. And so it's unclear whether or not he is intending to take up a more comprehensive immigration reform. He's spoken about legalization. Uh, and he's spoken about uh, changing how things are done at the border, but he has not spoken much about legal immigration reforms. And I think that that's an issue that, that Canada is very, very interested in. But as I said, um, unfortunately, in debates about immigration reform in the United States, Canada is not usually at the center of them. Uh, and it, it tends to be an afterthought. Um, and so I, I think that people who are interested and concerned um, should find a way to weigh in. Unlike the United States, Canada does have an ambassador in Washington right now who is very well connected and uh, makes herself known to the administration very regularly, which is one of the reasons we probably saw the clarification of the last executive order very quickly. Um, so I, I, I think we can expect more of that. Um, the last thing I would say is keep an eye on, this, on the Canadian court system and the Safe Third Country Agreement. I mean, that, that agreement has been in place for around two decades, um, and uh, it had been court challenged before and upheld. It had been, this court case uh, did not necessarily rule that the United States system was illegal, but ruled that specifically the detention of asylum seekers by the United States violated their Canadian charter rights and that the Canadian government act of returning to them to the United States was also a violation. So I would pay attention to that, most importantly because the Canadian Safe Third Agreement primarily benefited Canada uh, because it required that it allowed them to return asylum seekers to the United States and not have to process them in the Canadian system. And so there will probably be a renewed push to try to find something uh, that would allow the Canadian government to work with the United States again, um, but it remains to be seen what that'll be. Thank you, Teresa, and, and Canada's never an afterthought at the Canada Institute, but uh, we now turn to our one Canadian panelist, Mina Rafi, your thoughts. Um, excellent, I will keep it super short. I mean, I think both Teresa and Richard covered it um, really well. From a business immigration perspective, I think, you know, as we've been talking about, the Trump administration has, you know, dramatically transformed the U.S. Um, immigration landscape. And as we mentioned, not just sort of through the executive order, but also in small technical details where they've issued through policy statements coming out of USCIS. So in terms of changes, I think, um, you know, the damage has already been done. A lot of these companies have already gone ahead and moved a lot of the talent and mobility that they have um, to other countries, some of them being Canada, sort of being the largest probably beneficiary. Um, so in that regards, we, I don't expect that to change anytime soon. And it, I think this 
the past three and a half years has also sort of left a really um, bad, um, maybe I shouldn't say bad, but negative um, idea of what it's like to immigrate to the United States. And that's going to stay for a very long time. And as a result, other countries like Canada, India, and China are going to benefit greatly from the uh, talent pool of individuals that are looking for um, other opportunities outside of their home country. Um, so the only answer is really going to be, like Richard mentioned, is looking at a comprehensive immigration reform as a way to try to bring back some of these people, some of the talent, and make businesses feel more comfortable that if they are going to invest um, in the United States, that it will be worthwhile for them and the talent that they want to bring in. Mina Rafi, Teresa Brown, Richard Sanders, thank you all very much. This has been a terrific discussion of a very important issue, probably one we'll come back to in the future. I want to thank you for your time and thank our audience for watching.